This is a, a screencast on searching with lies. It's a, a variation on a on a childhood game called Twenty Questions. But uh, uh, the difference is that in Twenty Questions you ask twenty questions, yes or no questions, trying to find a number that your that the other uh, opponent is has uh, has kept secret from you and. In searching with lies, your opponent is allowed to lie a certain number of times, and you still have to determine the number. Well, the um, origin of this game is not really known. I, I think it was brought to everyone's attention by Stanislaw Ulam in his autobiography, Adventures of a Mathematician, um, a very good autobiography, and there's Stanislaw Ulam there on the left, um, but he uh, he actually, I think, re recalled what um, other people had noticed. There was a, there's a mathematician named uh, Renier um, who earlier had written in Hungarian uh, on this uh, question, where um, but a lot of people didn't uh, weren't reading Hungarian and. And uh, of course, uh, Stanislaw Lewin uh, knew of this and just was basically reminding people of this interesting problem. And uh, at this stage, um, there's a fairly large literature. But here's the problem. So we have two players, player one and player two. Player one guesses um, a number, or keeps secret a number from one to M, where M is some fixed number, let's say a million, for the sake of this. Let's, uh, let's just say player one has guessed a number from one to a million and kept it secret. Player two now asks a series of yes or no questions in an attempt to try to find uh, that number. Uh, now, player one can lie at most E times, and E is this fixed number that both players have agreed on in the beginning. And we want to assume best possible play on both sides, of course, and the question is, what is the minimum number of questions that player two uh, can ask in order to, in general, determine this number that player one has selected? And uh, so th this actually breaks up into two sub-games or sub-problems. The first is what's called the, the feedback case. In that case, player two can ask player one its first question, and then depending on the answer that player one gives, player two's second question could be different. And then the, depending on the answer to that second question, his third question might be different, and depending on... The, so you player two can adapt his questions depending on the answer to the previous question. That's the feedback case. The no feedback case is when player one must ask all his questions up front at once with no feedback and with no adaptation allowed. Now it's clear that I hope that if you're allowed feedback that could potentially shorten the number of questions. Uh, but what I think is very remarkable, and I'll try to illustrate this in this um, talk here, is that there isn't that much difference. You don't get to ask that many fewer questions. You would think you could maybe substantially improve yourself if you are able to adapt your question depending on the previous one, but you really you can't save yourself a lot of uh, time, unfortunately. Or fortunately, it's very interesting. It really, the two cases are very, very similar in terms of the number um, number of questions that you'll ask, and we'll do an example and you'll see. Um, so there's a very large literature. If you just Google searching with lies, you'll see a huge number of papers. There's a survey paper in 1995 written by Hill. Um, I don't know of any other survey papers, unfortunately. There are a number of papers on the internet in PDF form, though. Um, no books, as far as I know, cover this topic, unfortunately. It does, even though it, it comes out of a child's the child's game, uh, uh, twenty questions, um, and it's also a variation on uh, what's my line. If you ever saw that, uh, 
game show on TV. There are a number of game shows on TV which uh, kind of are, are a variation of this. But um, uh, this actually, even though it has these uh, interesting um, uh, um, variations on children's games, it actually does have some serious applications to engineering and computer science. Okay, let's suppose that player one has guessed the number 524,289. That's, that's player one's number between one and a million that he's keeping secret from player two. And player two wants to determine that number. Well, the general strategy that player two could uh, employ would be to look at that interval from one to a million, imagine as this blue bar here, and try to subdivide it recursively. So first uh, figure out if it's in the left half of the blue bar or the right half of the blue bar. Uh, so you ask the question, is this number less than 2 to the 19th? And uh, 2 to the 19th is 524,288 it turns out. Uh, so the answer is no, and that tells us that it has to, this number that we don't know is in this blue half, the second bar here. And then you ask a question again, is it greater than 2 to the 19th plus 2 to the 18th? And the answer is no, so we omit that as well, and we're left with this little piece of the blue bar that the number belongs to. And we subdivide it again by asking another question, is it greater than 2 to the 19th plus 2 to the 17th? And that will omit this part. So by sub subdividing uh, this interval from 1 to a million uh, uh, over and over again, it turns out uh, we can determine this number in 20 steps. The reason why is because you can only subdivide the interval from 1 to a million 20 times and still keep an interval range, an integral range still keep integers in that range. So um, uh, so you can ask 20 questions by this adaptive type feedback style of uh, binary search and determine the number that player one has guessed. And here are the questions. Um, we start off with this blue bar. We don't know where the number lies from one to a million. And then the second bar here indicates uh, that we've omitted this first half because we got the answer to this first question to be false. Because that answer was false, we now will ask a different question uh, uh, than uh, possibly you would if you would have gotten uh, uh, the answer to be true. Uh, this is the next question that enables us to rule rule out uh, this interval here, so it has to be in this blue interval. And here are the remaining questions if you're interested. The last number, the, 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 the uh, first question says is it less than this uh, 524,288? The answer being no. And the answer to this being yes, since it has to be at least this, at least 524,288 and less than 524,290, the only remaining two are, um, or the, uh, the only remaining uh, ones would be uh, 5,224, 288, and 5,224, 289, and so uh, you can determine the number from these questions here. This is in the feedback case. In the non-feedback case, um, you have to be a little more um, difficult. It's a little more um, mathematical to uh, try to come up with the strategy. It's it's not hard, but it is a little bit more mathematical. The first thing is, player one would say to player, a uh, player two would say to player one, um, I would like you, player one, to first represent your number in binary as a vector. Uh, the first component. Uh, would be B0, second component B1, uh, the last component would be BN. Uh, here N is uh, actually 19, uh, so that 
20, there should be a 19. Um, and so you've got your, your num the number B that player one has kept secret uh, can be written in this fashion, where the, each of these B sub I's is either 0 or 1. And then the 20 questions are simply, is this first component a 0? Is this second component a 0? And so on. Is the last component a 0? These two, these components are either 0 or 1. If so, if the answer is yes, you know the value is 0. If the answer is no, you know the value is 1. So by asking these 20 questions, you've completely determined all these components, and therefore you've determined all these coefficients. And then once you know all the coefficients, you just multiply them by suitable powers of 2 and add them up, and you've got the number. So that's the method you would use if you ask, have to ask all the questions at once with no feedback and no adaption. Now, the, the number of questions is the same right, as in this case when you have feedback. So having uh, the ability to adapt your questions to answers does not uh, shorten the number of questions if there are no, uh, if there are no lies uh, allowed, if, the, if, if player one is not allowed to lie at all. That uh, player one has secretly selected a number uh, from 1 to m, and player two is going to ask a series of yes or no questions to try to determine that number, and player one is allowed to lie some fixed number of times, and uh, we want to figure out what's the smallest number of questions that player two can ask to determine this number. Now, um, I'm going to uh, simplify things a little bit here and actually just look at numbers instead of from 1 to a million from 0 to 15. And the reason why is this is a much smaller set and it's much easier to explain the ideas. Again this is a little bit technical but we're going to try to look at um, the same game just a little bit simpler version. So this is a simple version that just looks at uh, uh, the case when player 1 has guessed a number from 0 to 15 and player 2 is going to try to figure out that number. Player 1 is going to keep his number secret and uh, he is allowed to lie one time if he wants to. So here's the way to start uh, this. Player 2 would ask player 1, not only do I want you to write your number in binary, Actually, I would like you to encode it in this particular way. So notice the binary version of zero is just all zeros, and then the code word is all zeros. Uh, in, the, in this case, the binary version is 0001, and notice that that block occurs in this block here. So each of these, when you put it in binary, it's going to go in the first four components. And then afterwards, there are different... Um, uh, these are called check digits. There are different digits. There are three digits that are appended. These digits are uh, going to de depend on the first four digits in a, in a way that um, uh, possibly we'll talk about a little bit later, but the, it's just going to add some redundancy. Now, here's what player two does to guess the number. So let's assume um, player one might have guessed uh, nine, let's say. And so player one would have this component, this vector component in mind. All right, so there's seven zeros and ones there. And what we do now is we put those seven into each of these regions. So the first component goes into this region, second component goes into region number two, third component goes into region number three, and so on. So they get uh, stuck into these different regions. So uh, circle A has uh, four regions. Each of them has either a zero or a one in it. Circle B has four regions. Circle C has four regions. And now what we do, so in this case, uh, for example, region four would be a one, and so there would be a one right in this region here. of the Venn. This is a Venn diagram three circle Venn diagram. All right now we're going to ask these questions. We're going to look at these circles and we're going to check 
what's called a parity failure, whether we're going to see if this uh, parity failure occurs or not. So in the case of 9, here's our numbers here, and we would put in, um, well, let's, let's fill in, um, as an example, let's fill in circle C. So we need to know the first, the third, the fourth, and the seventh component. So the first is a 1, third is a 0, fourth is a 1, and the last one is a 1. So there are three 1s and a 0 in circle C. Now when you add them up, what you'll get is what's called the parity check. So you'll add up the three 1s and the 0, and that'll give us, if we add things mod 2, if we add in binary, that'll give us a 1. So 3 and 1 are the same in binary. Okay, so that would say that circle C would violate a parity check. Okay, so circle C would violate a parity check. What you do is you just check to see which of these uh, regions uh, have their parity check fail. And um, if none of them fail, then there are no errors, in which case uh, you know the person was telling the truth uh, you know that player one was telling the truth, and therefore you can just um, follow the strategy that we did before, where you look uh, at the first four digits. Is the first four digits of the seven tuple are already over here? Once you know the binary form of the number, you can go back to the table. So, if there wasn't, there were no lies told, then we would know the first four digits of the code word. What we're calling the code word here. And then we would look up in this table and we'd figure out the answer was a 9. Um, but if there were some failures in the parity check, then um, let's say there was a failure in the A circle and in the C circle, then the error position, according to this table, would be in the third position. So that would mean that instead of uh, telling us is the third component a 0, Instead of saying yes, player one would lie and say no. So we would get one zero one one zero zero one. That would give rise to a error in the third position. Essentially, that would uh, be equivalent to saying that there would be a, a parity check failure here as well as here. But the third position is actually shared by both A and C, and so we could actually then fix that since we knew that's where the error was. We would know that third position is wrong, so we would change that one to a zero, and we would get this. They were, therefore, we'd have all four of those. We'd figure out that the binary form was this, and then using the table, we'd know the answer was a nine. So that's how to um, solve the searching with lies question if player one is going to guess a number from. 0 to 15, and he's allowed to lie once. What you do have to know is you have to know what this table is. Now, these uh, filling in um, these circles um, and asking the question, is, uh, is the circle uh, region number 1 a 1 or a 0, is circle region number 2 a 1 or a 0, asking these types of uh, 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 questions um, would enable us to figure out what this code word was with one, except possibly one bit might be wrong. This whole strategy basically involves what's called a Hamming code, and it's explained in uh, the literature in several different places. Um, one of them is um, in this uh, really excellent survey here by Hill, and another is in this uh, expository paper by Niven. Um, in the case when feedback is allowed, it's a much more difficult uh, question, it turns out, and then you, uh, well, is what much more involved and technical, I won't go into it here, um, uh, it's explained in this uh, very well written paper by Pelk, and um, this uh, thesis here you can find online. Uh, just Google Montague 
uh, Justin Montague a, a solution to Ulam's problem with error correcting codes. That explains it as well. And uh, so that's the case when you're allowed to lie once and you're guessing a number from 0 to 15. It's helpful to start introducing some notations. Let's go back to our problem where we have player 1 and his number is going to be between 1 and m, and player 1 is also allowed to lie uh, some fixed number of times. Uh, e, let's call it e. e is the number of times that player 1 can lie. And then um, player 2 is going to try to ask uh, yes or no questions uh, of player 1 to try to determine that number. Now, they'll, both players will be playing uh, best possible uh, uh, we'll assume best possible play from both players and uh, if feedback is allowed we'll call the smallest number of yes no questions a player 2 can ask f of m1 and that's the feedback case if there's no feedback we'll call the minimum number of questions uh, g of me f of me is when uh, there is feedback g of me is when there isn't feedback so uh, the reason why f is less than or equal to g is because if you're allowed to adapt your questions depending on the uh, answer to the previous question, it makes sense that possibly you could ask a, somehow cleverly configure your questions to ask a smaller number of questions. But in fact, what's remarkable is that it really um, the questions uh, there aren't, it isn't going to be that much of a difference. There, there's a, a, a table we can look at to, uh, to, to look at this, and here's a, a table of values when there's one lie. Uh, so this line, this first line here, means that player one is going to guess a number from 1 to 11, and he's going to be allowed to tell one lie. How many questions would player two have to ask to determine that number in general. If feedback is allowed, in other words, you can ask each question adaptively, then 7. If feedback is not allowed, it's still 7. And notice, and notice that all these are odd. It turns out, for a strange reason, we have to break the, uh, the answers up into odd and even here. So in the odd case, these are all the same up to 35, and then they differ. And this table only goes up to 49. In the even case, as soon as you hit 18, there's actually a difference. So if, if, uh, if player one guesses a number from 1 to 18, and if you're allowed feedback, you, you can get away with one fewer question than if you aren't allowed feedback. But notice how close these are. I think that's very, very interesting that they're so close. Now, if you remember, we actually looked a moment ago at an example where one line was allowed and player one was asked to convert his number, the number he guessed, let's say he guessed number nine, first into binary like this and then to encode it like this. Well, this uh, list here of what we're calling code words is going to play a role in describing uh, what happens in general. In general, we're going to define a code, or more precisely a binary code, to be a set of n tuples of zeros and ones um, of length n, where n is some fixed number. In this case, it was 7, n was 7. So that's what a code is. And a code word is just an element of that set. So C would be all these vectors in this third column here. Uh, the Hamming distance between two different code words is just the number of non-zero coordinates in, uh, in their difference. So, for example, the Hamming distance between this vector and this vector is uh, 3. That vector differs from this vector by 3 different coordinates. And uh, so that's the Hamming distance. And here's an example. Uh, 
your two vectors, they differ by having distance 3, so you would say the minimum distance of this entire code is 3. The minimum distance is the smallest of all the possible Hamming distances. It turns out the minimum distance of this code here is 3. And now, uh, this is a little bit more technical definition. We're going to say that a code is E error correcting if this property always holds. Given any vector in any code word, if that vector lies within E distance from that code word, then for every other code word, it must be at least E away. In other words, if you're close to a code word, by close I mean you're within distance E, if you're close to a code word, uh, uh, then you have to be far away from every other code word. That's roughly what this says. And if you let a and D denote the smallest possible size of a binary code of minimum distance D, then you can, then there's this formula here for uh, G of ME. There is actually a way to determine the size of G of ME. Uh, that's the non-feedback case, depending on this. Unfortunately, this function here, A and D, uh, is very difficult to determine, and in fact, it's one of the most difficult problems in coding theory. Let's wrap up uh, here by uh, giving you an algorithm that helps you determine the an upper bound, a good upper bound, for the number of questions that player two has to ask player one, where player one has picked a number from one to m, and he can ally e times. And we're looking for an upper bound um, for actually either f or g, but since f is less than or equal to g, we'll find an upper bound for g. g is the number of questions you have to ask if there's no feedback allowed. Uh, so to recall uh, that uh, we're going to have player 2 ask player 1 to take his secret number and not only write his number in binary, but also to encode it into a code C, where C, this code C is E error correcting and has been agreed upon by both players in advance. Uh, here C is uh, going to be E error correcting and we even have an upper bound on C in terms of uh, this A and D function where A and D was uh, this uh, number that's been tabulated in tables uh, on the internet uh, but it it's denotes the largest uh, possible size of any binary code of minimum distance D. Now we'll also introduce here the largest possible size of any bi binary linear code, not just a binary code, which might or might not be linear. By linear code, we mean a, a code C that actually has a vector space structure um, as a subspace of GF2 at the end, of minimum distance D. And it's known that um, in that case, that B and D is actually has to be a power of 2, and the K uh, that occurs in that power of 2 is called the dimension of the code C. So uh, it's pretty clear that A is less than B because uh, A does not require the code to be linear whereas B does. So, so B could be possibly, uh, you might need to have a larger code if you have to have it linear. And um, remember that G, the largest number of questions that player 2 has to ask player 1 when player 1 lies e times and um, and no feedback is allowed, uh, that you can determine g by this, uh, the smallest n for which this uh, inequality here is true. So if we want only an upper bound, we can ask for the smallest n for which this is true, where a is replaced by b. The advantage to b is that b is more tabular. There, there are uh, larger sets of tables for b than for a, so that's the main reason for switching to b. 
Now, what have we done here? Intuitively, what we've done is that if you're player two and you ask player one what coordinates of the code word C associated to his secret number is, and if he lies E times, you're going to receive from him not C, but actually some vector W that's of hamming distance E from the code word that he picked, um, uh, his secret code word. So you won't be able to figure out what C is from his answer, but you'll know it uh, pretty close, a pretty good approximation. We'll know a vector that's having distance E from C, and because C is E error correcting, it turns out, in, at least in principle, you can determine C from W. So that's the purpose of uh, using this uh, kind of roundabout procedure of embedding this problem into such a, a structured mathematical situation. Okay, well, as I said, uh, A is tabulated in some tables, but uh, B is more is better tabulated, and there are several websites here. Um, what we'll do is we'll use this website here. And so just to summarize what we're going to be doing, it, here's the recipe. We're going to, and we'll do some examples uh, using um, these tables here, and uh, this is the min t table that we'll actually go to. Um, but... Uh, First, we're going to, um, to, to get an upper bound on the smallest number q of questions that player 2 must ask player 1. We're going to first find a k such that 2 to the k is greater than m. Um, the reason why we're looking at k is because the tables here actually are in terms of uh, uh, k instead of 2 to the k. All right, so we'll find that k. We'll go to these tables, and we'll go to this row number, and then we'll find the smallest column number that contains an entry greater than or equal to k, and that'll give us our upper bound. So let's do uh, a couple examples. Let's start with this example here. So m is 11. We go here, and we're looking, m is 11, we're looking at the case when there's one lie told. e is 1, and m is 11. E is 1, so that means D, which is 2E plus 1, must be 3. And we want the smallest K, such that that K is greater than or equal to 11. Right? So is 2 to the 1 greater than 11? No. To the 2 greater than 11? No. To the 3? No. To the 4? 2 to the 4 is 16. That is greater than um 11, and so, I'm, no, it's on the wrong, <laughs> sorry, I can start over again here, it's actually in the wrong uh, row, uh, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, that's 8, still not greater than 11, 2 to the 4, there we are, 2 to the 4 is greater than 11, so we stop here and we find the column number, which is 7, and the answer is 7. We got an, we all this table does. It gives us an upper bound, but in fact, we got the exact value. Let's pick another one. Let's go down here to 33. M is 33. Okay. Let's see what kind of upper bound we get for 33. So again, we're in the one line case. Uh, we are looking at powers of two. Two to the one. Two to the two. Two to the three. Two to the four is 16. Two to the five is 32. That's still less than 33. 2 to the 6. We finally get there. 2 to the 6 is 64. That's less than 33. And so 10 would be our upper bound. But in fact, 10 is not the correct answer. The correct answer is known to be 9. Okay, so we're not getting the exact value every time, but we're getting something pretty close. Let's look at uh, some other examples. If we look at some of the examples from um, the table that we looked at earlier uh, that was due to Hill and Krim and Burlikamp, uh, there they looked at the case when M was uh, 10 to the 6th, which is basically um, 2 to the 20. So it's very close to 2 to the 20. Uh, and let's go out to, let's say, 5 lies. Okay, 5 lies. Let's go here. Going to five lies, that means uh, D, E is five, so D, which is two E uh, plus one, will be 11. And we are looking for um, 
m is uh, two to the and m m is uh, two to the twentieth. Actually, uh, m is uh, ten to the sixth, which is approximately two to the twentieth. So, we go here, go out to. We're trying to get to nineteen. These are powers of two. Remember, these are the k's that we're going to take two to. Um, that we're going to raise two uh, to the power of, and uh, that's not big enough. So we'll use this arrow to go out and get some larger values. Right, we're still here. And we need 19. Here's 19. And uh, we need a number 2 to the k, where 2 to the k is greater than or equal to 10 to the 6. 19 is actually less than that, so we'll need 20. Here, 20. So the answer is 43. That's our upper bound. Let's go to the table here, see a 43. 43 is not too bad. I mean, the answer is 40 but 43 is pretty darn close.